Hello, my name is Dorothy Ellen Palmer. I'm a retired high school teacher, improv coach, union branch president, and now a disabled senior writer. Unfortunately, today is a really bad pain day for me, so I'm gonna be reading the rest of my talk to you. What kind of inclusion in the arts can I possibly expect when I haven't left my apartment in seven months, since March 8th, while I stay home in an attempt to save my life and the life of others, I can and do expect equal virtual access. Ironically, virtual access can improve inclusion for disabled people and seniors like me. But please let me first explain a little bit about my work as a disability activist in CanLit. Before the pandemic, only 3% of literary events in Canada were wheelchair accessible. Most were held in funky downtown buildings with steps at the door and a washroom in the basement, inaccessible to me and my walker. As I've researched and written, Toronto has zero wheelchair accessible independent bookstores. The entire country of Canada has zero wheelchair accessible writing retreats. Governments and arts councils happily violate their own funding guidelines and the Charter of Rights, when they, which forbid discrimination by ability. Of course, ableism is systemic, but its exclusion is practiced and perpetuated by the daily choices of individuals. When I asked my CanLit colleagues to please not organize, perform at, or attend any inaccessible events, some agreed. We're building bridges and doing great work together but most offered me the equivalent of thoughts and prayers. I got told that my inclusion was too expensive, too time consuming, too fringe, not urgent, not possible this year, not possible at all, but maybe next year, dear, if you do the unpaid labor to find us a new venue. This reply came from politically aware colleagues who would be horrified at excluding any other marginalized group but keeping my communities out? Oh well, too bad, so sad. Ableism and ageism are the only hatreds that come with an apology and a shrug. Accordingly, it is bittersweet for the disabled community during this pandemic to see all the virtual access to jobs, education and the arts that we have been demanding as our human rights for decades become widely and instantly available because abled people needed them. It has also been exciting, energizing and uplifting to explore the possibilities of virtual access with the disabled community. I was delighted, for example, to be a keynote speaker for 50 young disabled storytellers. That virtual event with both ASL and captioning made it possible for young artists right across the country to both participate in and attend who would have not been able to do either in person. We've all heard the phrase, we can't go back to normal because normal wasn't working. I'm so glad abled people have finally discovered this. But just as Columbus did not discover America, abled people did not discover inaccessibility or its solutions. Disabled seniors and pe disabled people have been here all along. It is, however, the same colonial capitalism that wants us to think that only the voices of able people matter, that whining about Zoom fatigue is more important than facing the fact that Zoom gives temporarily inconvenienced able people far more inclusion than they ever gave me. This uncomfortable truth has real life consequences. The exclusion of seniors and disabled people, especially the exclusion of racialized seniors and disabled people fuels eugenics. It accepts disabled and senior erasure. It normalizes the vile idea that disabled people and seniors who do not produce wealth for capitalism are disposable and expendable, that we are what the Nazis called life unworthy of life. This is the very eugenics that writes pandemic hospital protocols deciding who will die. After the pandemic, will disabled, art, will disabled artists rush right back to using inaccessible buildings and formats 
and pretend they're doing nothing wrong? Probably. But if we want to change that, we must start including disabled people and seniors now. We must demand a representation that reflects our numbers as 23% of the population. This means that one in four participants at every event should be disabled. One should also be a senior. It means grappling with this. Despite what their other important intersections and identities might be, no group of abled people under 50 is truly ever diverse. Young able diversity is not true diversity. It's just better looking exclusion. Whose job is inclusion? It's my job, it's your job, it's everyone's job. True inclusion can only be reached when we all agree consistently to act on the first principle of disability justice. All bodies are good bodies and there must be no body and nobody left behind.